live from the Julia Morgan Ballroom in San Francisco. Extracting the signal from the noise, it's the Cube, covering Structure 2015. Now your host, George Gilbert. And we're back. This is George Gilbert. We're at the Julia Morgan Ballroom in downtown San Francisco at Structure 2015. We have a very special guest with us, Bob Muglia. Bob, welcome. Good to see you, George. And um, at the risk of being politically incorrect, for the five people in Bangladesh who don't know who you are, can, can you give us I a quick intro? It's a few more than that. Um, I, uh, I spent 23 years at Microsoft, seven years or so as president of Server and Tools, so, so focusing on, on uh, Windows Server, SQL Server, Azure at the end, and uh, I'm now at Snowflake Computing. Okay, very illustrious. Okay, so let's drive, dive right back, dive in. Um, so, for those of us, you know, we've been talking about uh, infrastructure as a service, platform as yeah. a service, uh, software as a service. Let's focus in on, on databases, since Snowflake is a, is a database, a, an analytic database. Right. What's the difference between a database as a service and a managed, managed service? service. Yeah. It, it's all about squirrels. All right, elaborate. So the difference between between a true a true software as a service or database as a service offering is that it's it's a comp it's a service that can serve many many different customers very effectively. It can run in an automated fashion. A managed service is really typically built by taking an on-premise uh, system, hosting it in the cloud, and just and just having people manage it. I, I call it squirrels, right? You've got humans kind of on the treadmill right. keeping the thing going, and it's uh, it's very 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 different than having software behind it. So it's, it's about software versus people. So uh, let me drill into that one, uh, one level down. Um, if you had uh, squirrels and you standardized the operation right. of a managed service, could you automate many of those human intensive Things. Not really, because what you're doing is you're building, you're sort of stamping out typically and building one of these systems after another, essentially typically dedicated to a customer. The other, the other part of this is really about multi-tenancy and single tenancy. Most of these managed services are single tenant, so they're designed to run for one one organization, whereas a true database as a service like Snowflake is multi-tenant. We support many, many customers you know, in a shared environment. Now, we do, one thing we do do is we isolate customer data, we encrypt customer data, and we actually give people essentially dedicated clusters to run and compute the data. So that's very isolated, but the system is designed to operate and scale to many, many organizations in a multi-tenant way. So what would be some of the other things that you do as a uh as a database right. service that you couldn't do as a, as a managed service. In other words, what have you wired or what have you designed differently you know, so that you know, someone, uh, a user or developer doesn't have to worry about, say, partitioning sure. or failover? In fact, it's, it's, I'd, I'd say, the way I would put it is it's yeah. what you, we don't do. Okay. The software is designed so we don't need to build indices. We don't need to do partitioning and build partitioning keys. We don't need to vacuum and, 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 and clean up things. The software automates all of that. It's just part of the way we run. And, and what we've done is we've eliminated all those knobs that typically fall on, in an on-premise environment, the DBA. I mean, ultimately, there's a DBA involved in right. solving those problems for, for all of the other databases except Snowflake. We just don't require it because of our architecture. Would that prevent someone who started out with an on-premise database from sort of migrating ultimately to this form in the sense that if they automated some of these knobs, they'd break the processes yeah. that, you know, that a, say an Oracle uh, DBA has assumed would be there? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that the, the key is that the architecture of all these other systems, which typically dates back 20 or 30 years, right? The code is old in these systems. Right. They require these knobs. And you can put some algorithms and things in front of it. In fact, in fact, our, our, our CTO and, and one of our founders, Benoit Degaville, that's what he did at Oracle. His job at Oracle was to take this mass of different knobs that Oracle, and Oracle was the, is the king of knobs, yes. right? It's always been. His job, you know, for many years was to try and automate all of that, and he recognized it was a hopeless task, and he realized if he started from scratch without some of these, these, these knobs and, and change the assumptions fundamentally, you could have a very different thing, and that's, that's the core to what I would call database as a service in Snowflake. Okay, all right, that's pretty clear. 
So now let's put together sort of two other concepts. Um, we see, you know, the data lake on, on one side of the spectrum is a, some people call it the, the data swamp, where you put the data where you don't have to decide up front right. how it's organized. And, um, you know, the other end of the extreme, terror data where everything's perfectly curated. Right. Um, so they're not direct substitutes for one another, but perhaps there's an analogy between um, what we call Hadoop 2.0, you know, at its core, HDFS and YARN, and then Big Data 3.0, which is like a converged analytics platform. Mm -hmm. Help us make sense out of sure, that. Sure, I, th I think, I mean, I think what you're seeing is, is the alternatives that people have had traditionally available. Okay. You know, on the one end, you have traditional relational data warehouses, of which Teradata, Netiza, Oracle, I mean, those are all examples of that. Right. And typically, that's structured data, it's data that is highly curated. You know, on the other hand, in today's world, there's a lot of data that is generated by machines, and it takes on what we would typically call a semi-structured form. It's very dynamic in its content, it changes all the right. time, and it doesn't have a fixed schema. That's the key, it does not have a fixed schema. Up to now, the only choice people have had is it, to work with that data is to put it in, you know, in a Hadoop-based solution, and that's the data lake, data swamp, whatever you want, whatever you want to call it. And, right. And then, then from there, you have this relatively unorganized mess, and you have to work to to get it out. Anytime you want to get data out, you have to write something specific to pull it out, and and it 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 is it it makes it relatively difficult to work with information. What we've done with Snowflake is totally different in that we certainly support with a full relational database, a full SQL, you know, really as complete as what you'd find in a Teradata or a Netiza from a SQL capability. So we have the ability to work beautifully with structured data, but we can apply all that same technology to semi-structured data that, that maybe is coming in in the form of JSON or Avro. And so you can, you can essentially use Snowflake as a data lake where the data is stored in its almost native format, but then we infer the, the actual structure from the data and allow you to run standard queries against it. So this sort of leads into my next question, which is if we wanted to go from the world of Hadoop 2.0 where we sort of have this pipeline of, right. um, sort of pipeline of mini, mini processes or coarse grain processes with a lot of latency and we want to move to the next generation which is some sort of converged platform, um, what might that pipeline look like and and how can you simplify that well i, I mean I, I i sort of hate to say that it just looks like snowflake i mean it, <laughs> it is i mean it is the solution that we built i mean see the thing about oh, you snowflake, mean it handles sort of we handle that that see we're an incredible transform engine snowflake is an incredibly effective transform engine and we're able to ingest in a in a native format this semi-structured, typically JSON-based data. Right. And you know what we literally do is, as the data is being read in, we 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 see and infer the structure that's in there, and then we apply the same kind of technology that we would apply to structured data. We columnize it, and we 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 build metadata information about that, so we can prune it effectively. And so our queries are ultra fast against it. And 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 what that allows people to do is to use one system just with SQL to actually to curate their data. So you can take data in a raw form in and then put it in a form that's very easy for business analysts to use all just using standard SQL. Okay. So all those steps can merge together. So w now let's take what may be a step for some others, one, one more step, which is I want to um, embed sort of uh, a machine learning um, yeah. model you know, a predictive model, a prescriptive model that machine learning has extracted from the signal in your repository. No, then, you know, so that's still one more step in the pipeline. So you've collapsed several steps, but we need, let's say, for some applications, one more. No, it's a good question. So, you know, for most of what people do, they're working with data in a direct format, and what they really just want to do is put Tableau or, or a, a standardized BI tool on top of this right. data. So they have all of this data, they want to be able to get access to this data for their business analysts through a standard set of tools, which is very straightforward to do with our solution. You know, the, the, now you're saying, hey, but I, what I really want to do is do some additional 
um, algorithmic processing on it. I want to use some sort of iterative processing which might look like machine learning. Um, and how would I do that? Right. And you know, there sometimes people use R directly on on it, and they, and they hook R up to a tool like Snowflake, and they they work typically on a single on a single computer. If you need to do high levels of machine learning, um, now you need to do a set of iterative parallel processing. And there, a tool like Spark is really really effective. And the thing about Spark is that sometimes people think that Spark and Hadoop are coupled together, but they're not. They're definitely not coupled. And in fact, Spark can operate on independent data sources, and Snowflake is a perfect data source, and we're, we're connecting to Spark. And because we're an entire, you know, Spark oh, so is Spark parallel. Spark could be uh, an alternative compute engine on top of Snowflake. On top of Snowflake. And our also, would it would our work in Inside a multi- Inside Spark, if you can, within the context of Spark, oh, now you can choose so you get the environment. The scale out you get the scale out, you get the parallelism and scale out that Spark provides. And Spark is in, you know, in, inherently iterative and it is inherently parallel. Right. Snowflake is inherently parallel. So we can output data incredibly quickly to Spark, which then can be operated on and machine learning algorithms can, can be can be done and then frankly in a parallel way injected back into Snowflake. So it's almost like a, it's almost like um, the Postgres or or Illustra, you know, sort of extensions, I forgot what they were called. But Spark is your it could yeah. be your extensibility and, story. And, and what you do in Spark is you issue essentially a SQL command to extract the data out. And Spark and Spark SQL are not an efficient way of processing terabytes and terabytes of data. We are. So if you just pass the SQL down to us, we can pass out a result set in parallel, which is exactly what Spark would want to the, operate on. The predicate push down. Exactly, do a predicate push down. Okay. Exactly. On that interesting note, Bob Muglia, we, we have to leave it. Um, this is George Gilbert, we're at the Julia Morgan, uh, um, I'm forgetting where we are, last, last uh, <laughs> interview it's of the day. It's late in the day, it's late yeah. in the day, isn't it? George Gilbert, Julia Morgan Ballroom, downtown San Francisco, we are at Structure 2015, and we will be back in a few moments. <laughs>